The Ryan XV-5 Vertifan was one of the first American jet-powered vertical and short takeoff landing experimental aircraft of the 1960s. Its ingenious design would pave the way for both the F-35B STOVL variant and the V-22 Osprey tilt rotor. Its performance and capabilities were impressive for its time. The XV-5 had a top speed of 546 miles per hour and a thousand mile range. It could perform well as a fighter jet and a helicopter, for it was equipped with a lifting cable for rescuing a downed man. This was possible thanks to the incorporation of ducted lift fans that could make the XV-5 transition between vertical and horizontal flights, allowing it to hover and even fly backward. Although impressive, the aircraft was not without its controversies. Its multi-purpose roles created a growing grudge and animosity between the resourceful U.S. Army's competencies and the newest addition to the armed forces, the U.S. Air Force. Both the Marines and the Navy had to pick sides, and the Pentagon had to intervene to enforce order between the military branches. In addition to this, the multiple fatal accidents that occurred while testing the XV-5 led to the project's cancellation before it entered production. Thus, the aircraft could never prove its capabilities during the bloody conflict that eventually became the Vietnam War. VTOL aircraft. During World War II, Germany and the U.S. tried to experiment with aircraft that could take off vertically to eliminate the necessity of relying on airstrips for takeoff and landings. For the Germans, the ongoing economic problems of the Third Reich at war halted their progress, and their prototypes never came to be. For the Americans, things went differently. For operations in Burma against the Japanese, they created the first fully functional military helicopter. Although primitive, it became a game-changer for the Allies conducting special operations behind enemy lines. When the war ended in 1945, the U.S. Army decided to go further with the idea of combining elements from helicopters and traditional aircraft. The idea was not new. Spanish engineer Juan de la Sierra had come up with something similar decades before with the Auto Gyro, which blended a free-spinning rotor and a conventional forward or rear-mounted engine. Still, the U.S. had a more ambitious idea, combining a helicopter's versatility with a supersonic jet fighter. When the Cold War began in the 1950s, and the USSR began experimenting on building its own nuclear weaponry, American commanders realized that if an imminent conflict against the Soviet Union broke out, the first objectives to be targeted by enemy atomic weapons would be airfields. If the Soviets were able to strike first and eliminate U.S. airbases all over Europe, it would significantly limit the American response time, just like they had done to Germany during World War II. With this in mind, the U.S. Army decided to pursue the idea of their hybrid aircraft. They were looking for a converter plane that wouldn't necessarily need a long runway, eliminating the need of securing or building airstrips. If they could build a vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, or VTOL, these new hybrid planes could land and take off in hundreds of different places, bringing them closer to the front lines and the soldiers they would be supporting on the ground. The Grudge Although the idea of the converter planes had a particular military purpose, it became controversial from the very start for its multi-purpose functions. Even though the Pentagon had turned the U.S. Air Force into a separate branch after World War II, leaving behind its old name as the U.S. Army Air Corps, the Army itself was still interested in having its own aircraft, especially after the Korean War. Dr. Ian Horwood, in his book Inter-Service Rivalry and Air Power in the Vietnam War, wrote, quote, The Korean War stimulated the expansion of Army aviation, with the service requesting both increased numbers of aircraft and aircraft of greater capability, which invariably meant heavier aircraft. More capable Army aircraft presented a threat to the Air Force because they would have the potential to perform a greater variety of tasks. The USAF, Navy, and Marines were not fond of the Army receiving more funds and firepower than them. The Air Force especially did not see with good eyes that the Army would have its own multi-purpose fighter to overshadow it. Thus, the problems between branches began. In 1951, in an effort to put an end to the grudge, Air Force Secretary Thomas K. Finletter and Army Secretary Frank Pace signed an agreement that limited the weight of any Army planes to less than 2,500 pounds. The USAF hoped this would eliminate the aspirations of the Army for having its own aircraft. Nevertheless, the Army claimed that its hybrid aircraft did not fall into such a category. The Air Force complained, and the Pentagon had to intervene again. After three years of negotiations, the Pentagon imposed a new deal that doubled Army planes' weight and allowed it to get away with creating the converter planes. A perfect blend. While the fight between both branches continued, the Army never stopped testing various aircraft designs. According to government documents from the time, the Army tested more than 30 different kinds of prototypes. In 1961, General Electric and Lockheed were commissioned for the production of a VTOL experimental aircraft. General Electric subcontracted Ryan Company to build the aircraft while it focused on the fan and wing concept. 
Ryan's design, the VZ-11, was redesignated the XV-5A Vertifan. Lockheed's VZ-10 Hummingbird became the XV-4. Both companies dubbed their prototype research planes to avoid any suspicions from the USAF. The purpose of this new project was described by author George J. Merritt, a combat pilot veteran of the Vietnam War, in his book Contrails Over the Mojave, the Golden Age of Flight Testing at Edwards Air Force Base. As he wrote, quote, The XV-5A Vertifan was designed and built for the Army's Transportation Research Command by Ryan Aeronautical Company San Diego in conjunction with General Electric, developers of the aircraft's lift fan propulsion system. The Army believed that VTOL aircraft could make a major contribution to the mobility needed for limited warfare. The XV-5A would be used for surveillance of the battlefield and rescue of downed aircrew. Freed from dependence on airfields, the Vertifan blended the flexibility of the helicopter with the performance of a jet. Ryan's XV-5 was powered by two General Electric J85GE5 turbojets, similar to other jets of its time. The real innovation was introducing GE's X353-5 lift fan in the nose and wings to provide the vertical takeoff functionality. The fans provided a vertical lift of 16,000 pounds. The three fans were cross-ducted to afford safety and control in the event of an engine failure. Roll and yaw control was accomplished by controlling the angle of vanes mounted under each wing fan. Two XV-5s were produced. One was painted in the classic army green, and the other would later be repainted in white NASA colors. Each one weighed 12,500 pounds, which was almost twice the weight of Lockheed's Hummingbird XV-4, standing at just 4,995 pounds. Both aircraft managed to reach a top speed of over 530 miles per hour, but were condemned to an unfortunate ending after dangerous test accidents. None would ever see action in Vietnam. Fatal Test In June 1964, Lockheed's first XV-4 prototype crashed, and the pilot was lost. Almost a year later, the same would happen with the XV-5 prototype. On the morning of April 27, 1965, during an official demonstration at Edwards Airfield, California, one of the XV-5As was doomed to failure. Both aircraft were performing high and low maneuvers to demonstrate the XV's maneuverability. Ryan's chief engineering test pilot, Lou Everett, performed a high pass when suddenly his XV-5 went into a 30-degree dive. Desperate, Everett tried to retake control, but it was too late, and he crashed into the lake bed. The accident board concluded that the unexpected dive resulted from a failed conversion when the aircraft tried to change from jet mode to fan mode. On October 5, 1966, another accident occurred when the surviving XV-5A was conducting a pilot pickup rescue operation using the rescue collar. Surviving footage shows how Major Dave Tittle handles the XV-5 without any problems. After various successful maneuvers lowering the cable near a dummy rescue pilot and hoisting him for a few seconds, the test rescue cable is lowered again from the XV-5 at about 50 feet. Major David H. Tittle aboard the XV-5, content that everything was going as planned, did so again in search of another successful attempt. Then, as seen on one of the footage cuts from the XV-5's camera, the horse collar attached to the cable undulated under the XV, whipping around in the wind as it made its way to the aircraft. Suddenly, the camera began to zoom in strangely, making way for the ground. And then the aircraft crashed. An instant before crashing, Major Dave Tittle initiated the ejection sequence. However, the sudden change of the roll attitude to the left altered Tittle's ejection seat's trajectory, rendering the ejection useless as the parachute did not deploy successfully. In his book, author George Merritt wrote that the accident occurred because, quote, the XV-5A was in a slight forward-moving turn while raising the sling. The cable managed to whip up into the left-wing fan inlet for the vertical thrust outlet. This caused the aircraft to roll to the left and lose power and control. In memory of his remarkable flight testing career, the test pilot school at Edwards Air Force Base created the Lethan Tittle Award to honor the legacy of Major Dave Tittle and Major Frank Lethan Jr., another pilot who died in October 1966. After the crash, the damaged XV-5 was rebuilt and used for another test until 1971, when it ended. Although no aircraft of the converted plane project would ever see combat, it paved the way for VTOL aircraft as something possible and achievable. Today, the surviving XV-5 can be seen at the U.S. Army Aviation Museum at Fort Rucker in Alabama. <laughs>